since it's an orderable group conference, let me uh, write my title in a sort of suitable way. This detecting. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, Hong Tech Chow and Zhang Lao Ping. So I said circular order groups, but I will not really think in terms of the circular orders, but in terms of the actions of the circle. Um, so the object we're going to look at the, the groups of homeomorphisms, uh, the circle preserving order. And um, we want to say something about, you know, under what circumstance that we can conclude that such a group is actually a dream out of the lab. And um, so here is a sort of a motivational picture. Um, you know, I'm not going to define all the terminologies in the core, but it's just that you know you should sort of take this as a you know big picture of the you know, all the related topics. Um, so you, when you have a three mouthful, um, also I'm a little bit vague about the adjectives I should put. Um, so for most of them, um, it's safe to say. Uh, I think it's it's a safe to assume that uh, whenever I three manifold, it's a hyper hyperbolic three manifold of finite volume. So when you have a a nice um, co-dimension one foliation on M, the existence of top foliation implies um, the fundamental group has a faithful action on S one. By order preserving homeomorphisms. Um, this is originally um, with the Durston and um, more concretely and even more generally proved by Caligari and Dunfield. Uh, it's called the universal circle. Here. Are. Um, another things which give you the the action of fundamental group on R uh, S1 is when you have a, either a quasi judicial flow or should don't flow. It also give you this. I think uh, for quasi judicial flow that's Caligari. Uh, for should don't also flow Sergio Finley. Also more more recently um if you have a veering triangulation then you also have this. So that's um, Frank Hill, Schleimer, and Severman. Uh, they call the veering circle. So in some sense, um, maybe not particularly here, but in some sense here, um, the, the strategy to find such an action is First, you try to find a the circular order on the set of uh, things which you get geometric from from this geometric information uh, of the structure you have in three manifold, and show that that's invariant under the fundamental group action, and and then extend the circularly ordered set to a circle and make it as a action on the circle by orientation proving from your morphisms. Uh, here, um, the circular order set comes from some set of special section of the uh, circle bundle over the leaf space of the lifted foliation in the universal cover. Here, the circular order set comes from the set of cusps of the triangulation, in the, again, in the universal cover. Uh, so they show there is a circular order invariant under the pi one action and it's completed to a circle. And all this um three different things uh give you uh the action on the circle by uh, orientation preserving homeomorphisms but also uh not just this with an extra information extra data and i think that this is what we need to hope to get um from the action to get one of the structures back okay. so what I'm going to tell you today is uh, sort of the um, suggestion to what to what to consider here, and I'll give you one example where we can actually recover the three manifold out of it. 
So that object is uh, called the circle lamination. So, um, so here's the definition. So I'm going to call lambda to be a lamination on the circle if it is um, a closed subset of S1 versus S1 minus diagonal mod of by involution. The set of unordered pairs of point on the circle um, such that any two element are unlinked. Whenever you have a, such a thing, this is just a set of pairs of point on the circle, and um, you just imagine your circle is uh, bound is a boundary of a unit disk in the plane, and each pair, if you draw a chord, uh, you may realize it as a lamination on the disk, and this can be done. Uh, well, if you, uh, well, it depends on your identification with your S1 with the boundary of the disk, but uh, it only depends up to uh, homeomorphism. So up to conjugate, the uh, derivative, you know, you can go back and forth. So um, you can even do further that you identify S1 with the idea boundary of H2 and imagine your um, each element in your lamination gives you one um, by infinite geodesic in H, H2. And here the link, unlinked means uh, they do not intersect in the interior of the hyperbolic plane, but they may have the same endpoint, one, one same endpoint, but that's okay. They, as long as they're destroying in the interior of the disk. So that's what unlinked means. So as I just said, uh, here, um, we, whenever you have a lamination in the circle, you can go to a geodesic lamination of hyperbolic plane and vice versa. So if you have a geodesic lamination of the hyperbolic plane, then you just forget about what, watching the disk and consider only the end point of the leaves that gives you a lamination on the circle. Um, so, Via this analogy, the, the elements on the lamination are called leaves. So elements are called leaves. And when you realize it as a lamination on the disk, each <coughs> complementary region is called the gap. So to be, um, I don't know, I mean, they, my, my collaborator sitting right there likes to uh, write this in a slightly different way so that there's a, so there's a language called the so-called lamination system where each leaf actually corresponds to uh, two open intervals which are a complement of that pair and you just axiomatically define what set of inter open arcs in the circle gives you exactly this and then work with it is uh, slightly better and, and when you're writing a proof but i think as a visualization i can just stick with this on top so, um, so what, what's the extra data there? The data is that um, all these three cases, you know, those three cases, this guy absolutely have preserved a pair. Um, so um, also all this, you know, three cases the word lamination comes from is different from each case but it all sort of reflecting the structure of the uh the you know the extra structure you have in dream animal so for instance here if you have a top foliation then uh when you look at the lift space of the lifted foliation the universe recovered how uh the lift space branches will give you the uh, way to the way to construct the lamination. So the lamination there will sort of tell you how the lip space looks like, and then the things like that. So it's a pretty durable lamination. So that's the thing I want to uh, assume for my group of homeomorphisms in the circle it has some laminations invariant and whether that structure of the invariant lamination can tell you about the structure of the group. So that's the question. Um, 
So the general arbitrary lamination doesn't tell you much. So here are some special cases of lamination. The lamination is called very full. Uh, for every point in the circle, either E is, is in the endpoint of lamination. Uh, I guess I didn't really define what it is. This is just a set of all points in the circle. Um, where there is some other point Q prime, so that the Q Q prime is in the lamination. Let's just forget about the actual the leaves, but you, you know all the collecting all the endpoints of all leaves at the lamination. It's just a set, subset of the circle, right? So that's the endpoint set. <clears throat> so either uh, P is in some endpoint of some leaf, or there is a rainbow at the in lambda, so that the um, this infinite sequence of leaves accumulating to p from the both sides. So, the lo local picture, yeah. Wait, so every point in the circle is either the end of the lamination leaf or in one of these rainbows? Oh, so actually I was ahead of myself. So, sorry. Um, this is what happens when you have a circuit provision. <laughs> um, I, I, well, so let me define very full in a slightly different way. This is consequence of very full. Um, I, th I guess I can take this as a definition, but then it will be different for other statements. So, um, all gaps are finite sided idea polygons. And the lemma is if lambda is very full, then this dichotomy happens. And what was your question again? Oh, I, I was so I just want to make sure I was understanding correctly that every point is either the end of a lamination or a limit of a rainbow. Is that what very full means? That that's what you get uh, for a lot, very full lamination. If you if you take this, that's what happening. But it's a lamination. Right. Wow. Okay. Sorry. It, 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 sorry. It, 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 but, but yeah. But thank you. <laughs> so, um, one artificial uh, example I can draw is you can just consider. Fairy diagram, fairy tessellation of H2. <laughs> <laughs> I, I claim that I can draw, so I have to <laughs> continue. But okay, so if I assume I continued, then uh, I would have a tessellation by either triangles. Um, then that's a very full emanation because all gaps are either triangles. But of course, um, I just said finite sided, uh, not just the triangles. So if you just remove a few uh, leaves there, it's still a very full lamination. And whenever you pick any point on the circle, uh, which is not an end point of any leaf, you can you can find the uh, infinitely many leaves, uh, which looks like this. Uh, so that's just such a consequence. And as a third of the old results, uh, which give you um, third of the um, okay, I'm not going to use this for okay. old result, uh, uh, the which sort of give you uh, like a, some some conv convincing um, idea why the in having invariant lamination can ever tell you about the group uh, at the theorem. Uh, originally, myself and improved uh, with him. So if you start from a homeomorphism group, group of homeomorphisms in a circle, uh, and if G, let's say, suppose G uh, has three, very full invariant laminations, the lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, um, such that 
the end point of any two laminations are disjoint, then it is a pi one of some kind of So here, if you, um, right, so what I mean by is, so here, if you identify your circle with the ideal boundary of the hyperbolic plane, then the group uh, orientation preserving isometries of H2 can be considered as a subgroup of a group of orientation preserving homeomorphism by identifying as one with ideal boundary of H2. One identification will give you one way to think about the isometric group as a subgroup there. So here it means there is a single homeomorphism which conjugate your group G within homeomorphism group into uh, the isometric group of H2. And, you, and then you take a quotient H2 by your group, then you get the hyperbolic surface. So that is means so there's the strongest possible meaning, right? Because the action you started with is originally already up to conjugacy is the action by the fundamental group of hyperbolic surface on the idea boundary of H2. So, um, so that's that. Now, how about three manifold group we promised to talk about? What's an example of the surface surface of the triple Example of what? That's a triple of Ah, okay. So if you start from a surface, and then one way to think about it is you decompose the surface into pairs of hands by three G minus three closed geodesics. And let me just take a close case and you can generalize that general case. Then you decompose each pair of hands into two ideal triangles by using my infinite geodesic accumulating to a pair of boundary components. You take three of them and then cut this into two ideal triangles. So you cut this into 4G minus 4 ideal triangles and lift it to the universal cover, you get a one very full lamination invariant under the deck group. And then you can use different pentate decompositions to produce different very full laminations. So in fact, this construction tells you that you actually do have infinitely many very full laminations um, on, invariant under the surface group. And what this theorem says is that there are, the three is enough to go backward. So it's actually if and only if statement, if you write quickly. The only case you cannot go backward is this, when surface is a three counter sphere, because it doesn't have a room to have three variable animations. If, if you had the, if, only if it's simple, but if you had the three laminations, is there like, assume, like can we see how the construction works of the surface? The Okay, I'll tell you more then. Um, Sorry. No, no, no. It, it, that, it that's very, good. That's good. Yeah. Been, yeah. That's good. So, um, one one way to see a word three is used mm -hmm. actually via this lemma I stated. So, let uh, F be an element in your group, the group as in the theorem. And suppose. I have a list prefix one. And take, well, not the identity element so that it doesn't fix everything. Then you can take one connected component of the complement of the fixed point set. So I is a open arc where there is no fixed point in the interior and the end points are fixed point of that. Okay. I is just that one connected component of the complement of the point set. Um, from our assumption, you can assume that, well, in lambda one, maybe there is a rainbow. So let's give a name for this point, A and B. Let's just say I have a rainbow at A. Because the set of endpoint uh, for any two pair of laminations are assumed to be disjoint, at least two of them should have rainbow in there, right? And most of one lamination can have A as endpoint of least. So let's just assume that uh, there's a uh, rainbow in lambda one and A, so there is some leaf 
very close to A. The very close here means that one endpoint is in I, in the interior of I, and the other endpoint is in between A and extra fixed point other than B, because such a thing exists by our assumption. The wherever it is, we, we have a sequence of leaves converging to A, so we can always find the leaf close enough to A so that the, the, this endpoint is in between A and the other. So what happens if we iterate F and see the image of L? Well, the on I is the homeomorphic to real line and F is the homeomorphism orientation preserving homeomorphism, which doesn't have any fixed points, so it's conjugate to the translation. So let us assume that F translate on I in this direction. Then when you let N goes to infinity, uh, this point will convert it to B. And how about this point? This point cannot convert it to A because if it moved toward A, then the image of L will be linked with L. So that wouldn't be a leap of elimination. But this doesn't happen. So this point should move away from A. And when N goes to infinity, it should converge somewhere, but it, the, the limit cannot go beyond C. It's a fixed point, right? But somewhere, it could be C or it could be somewhere before. Maybe there are more fixed points. The whole point is now we find a leaf L converted to some L where L has B as an endpoint. So in lambda one, by assuming there is a rainbow at A, B must be an endpoint to have a leaf. So in lambda two and three, they cannot have any leaf ending at B. The, in both lambda two and three, we have a rainbow at B, but by the same argument, then A must be an endpoint to belief in both lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, which is a contradiction to our assumption. So that doesn't happen, meaning that this is just not possible. So this already to say, um, well, each element in such a group has and moved two fixed points. And then each case you can analyze. So in, in the case when you have actually two fixed points, um, you look at the rainbow at one of the fixed points. It cannot move like this around the fixed point. The same reason, because the, the image will be linked with original leaf. So only possibility is you have one attracting and one repelling fixed point. So that looks like a hyperbolic isometry of H2. If there's only one fixed point, that's a parabolic isometry. And in the case when there is no fixed point at all, uh, you need to show that if you have a very full lamination in variant, then the rotation number is actually rational and it must be of final order. So that's just some extra argument to show. But anyway, so from, from this, basically, you can classify the element of the group. And if every element looks like an element in the isometric group of H2, the only problem is now we have a conjugation of each element into isometric group but you want to conjugate the whole group into isometric group at the same time. Um, that's where the big hammer is needed, at least for me. Um, so the, the hammer I use is convergence group theorem. And uh, I'm not gonna say too much about it at the moment, at least. Does it make sense? Anyway, so this actually say something about the topological dynamics of each element in the group is restricted from the data of the lamination. So now I'm gonna define some pair of laminations with structures, which will give us uh, three manifold groups. A pair of laminations is called a veering pair. If it's satisfied following um, conditions, the first, each lambda i is quite full and loose. Mm, I guess I did define very full, so I guess I'm going to modify it to give a definition of pipe full. So lambda is called pipe full if all gaps are either finite side, either polygons or crowns. And here's a picture of a crown. So it has infinitely many vertices. 
but has only one accumulation point on the circle and accumulated by the other vertices from both sides. And that accumulation point is called the pivot. This is I'm not sure. I guess the picture is not so clear because here I drew a small. But as again, uh, there are infinite many vertices accumulate to a single point from both sides. <laughs> so you're allowing one more type of gap for a quite full. So once you go from variable to quite a lemma, uh, has one more possibility because of the crown. So P is either in point or there is a rainbow or uh, P is the pivot of a crown. And that's the only new possibility by all one crowns pure lamination. And lose. Um, so that means in any lambda i, no two gaps share a vertex. So what kind of picture is not loose uh, if you have like this for instance sharing a vertex so that's a picture which is not loose the loose means you don't see um, such two gaps in your lineage but they're disjoint not only in the interior of the disk but also in the boundary of the disk <coughs> um and i also want to assume as before, the endpoint set is disjoint. And the last condition that um, they interleave. Um, let me first write and then explain what that means. So, for um, any gap, say P of lambda one or lambda i, there is a gap. P prime of lambda i plus one, where index is mod two, such that the vertices of P and P prime appear uh, in an alternating way on the circle. So I guess it's clear with the picture. So if I have this is your P, then do we have another color? Oh, sorry. Um, then the P prime looks like shit. Okay. And uh, if you have the crown case, then P prime is also crown. Looks like so they should share a share the pivot point. But the vertices, other vertices, uh, appear alternatingly on the circle. So this is the interleaving pair, interleaving pair of polygons, interleaving pair of crowns. And so the condition saying that if you pick arbitrary gap in one of these laminations, there is always a friend in another lamination which interleave with the original gap you choose. Any questions so far? This doesn't work. So Here's the theorem. <clears throat> Again, you start from a group of homeomorphisms of the circle. Suppose G preserves a varying pair of lamination. Then G is <clears throat> the fundamental group of irreducible three orbital. Um, if you don't like orbital, then you may assume G is version free to begin with and conclude that it's a manifold group. And now this is just uh, isomorphism. Um, and making this equality stronger in a similar sense as before is uh, still a still an uh, open direction. But anyway, so this is isomorphism. Yeah. I don't know what the loose condition is. An example of two gaps that don't share the Right. Um, or, right, right. So what happens? 
in the loose lamination in between two caps. So um, what, ha what, what usually happens is that there are um, actually like infinitely many polygons in between. So when you draw a transverse or arc, the intersection is typically a cantor set. So any so it's like any two gaps, there's more in front of any other gap to sort of separate them and still make it very full or quite full. Answer your question? You might require the like transverse we can set it's going to be full in the right line in between. Yeah. <clears throat> Each lamination may have that situation. Yeah, I'm not excluding that. But once you have two laminations with the disjoint endpoints that you can prove that there's no foliated region. Yeah. I'm trying to assume minimally on each lamination. So what do you mean? Tell you a little bit about where the dream animal comes from if you start from that pair of laminations. Um, the first space we construct from a varying pair of laminations is called S new. It's called uh, the stitches space. So the element here is a pair of leaves when L1 is a leaf of L1. Lambda one, L two is a leaf of lambda two, and L one, L two are linked. But now there are uh, leaves of two different laminations. They are linked. They can be linked. Uh, so they intersect in the interior of the disk. Can you draw as a lamination of leaves? So um, actually, better to really think in terms of um, this the disk lamination. This one intersection is one point in your stitches state. So now I'm going to define an equivalence relation on the element here. So two points in this space is um, equivalent if, again, it's easier to draw an interesting picture. So they are on the same leaf of one lamination. And in between them, on that leaf, there is no other stitch in between them. If you have these two intersection point, then you identify and take the equivalence class generated by this relation. So in, the, in terms of the interliving gaps here, so these points- So, so those have the same point on the boundary there. Same point on the band. It's just not just that they both intersect. Right. Um, they, 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 well, they, they share an influence. There you go. That's the word. So you're, you're saying whether it's possible to have two red like this without having this. I thought it would be the, with that picture that it would be all of the lamination that you're sharing that particular endpoint that intersect that particular. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think you can show it's impossible. So if you, if you have, oops, you're, you're asking where such a leaf is possible, right? Like, like this. Yeah. And, and that, and these are equivalent under our, our relation. It's not, yeah, it's not possible. You can share. So does an equivalent class end up looking like everything that, Sometimes the equivalence class is single point because maybe some leaf is accumulated by other leaves of the same lamination from both sides, then you wouldn't see this picture at all. Right. So then that single point is itself is an equivalence class. Right. So it could be that equivalence class consists of a single point. You kind of would get the, the limit points, and then you would get like everything in between the limit points. Like everything between these two limit points would be an equivalent class, and everything between those would be an equivalent class, and so on. Right. Okay. Right. So the one thing is um, one, 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 one of the easy topological lemma you can prove is you, you see the image of each leaf of the lamination. 
and then use this uh, Spomos relation to identify points. Well, in that case, of course, um, you have to actually collapse the whole thing. Then you get a real line again, topologically. So the image of a real, the leaf is a real line under the quotient. We, the quotient will explain this in a minute, but. Anyway, so in this picture, all this white point are identified. If they're related, they're related, they're related, etc. And in the interleaving crown, more points are collapsed, right? All the surrounding this region. So um, let me say W zero of new to be as new divided by this portion. And there's a way to think really this space, not just to set up pairs of leaves, but you actually consider this are the, as a subset of the disk. And then the elements are really the intersection point. And then this uh, equivalence relation should be extended to actually all this arc are identified. <laughs> and then if you do that, um, you can show the following. So first of all, I'm going to remove uh, cost classes after questioning. So this is um, uh, the images of interleaving crowns. So if, if that point comes from interleaving crown, then we call it a cost cost and remove it. And then here is a there's a theorem, intermediate theorem. So this guy is homeomorphic to a disk, open disk in the plane. So it's just a plane, topologically speaking, after you remove cusp point. And um, I was saying uh, when you're portioning out the image of each leaf of the lamination becomes a real line. So the lamination actually gives you a foliation. Uh, on that disk, except it, it may have a singular point. So what happens is if you consider all the images under the, the laminations, lambda one or lambda two, this guy is a disk with uh, a pair of transverse singular foliation, where the singularities actually come from the images of the interleaving polygons. So if you have a polygon with five vertices, this is five vertices, yes. Um, that will give you a five prong singularity and the foliation will be dropped here. And so this is the singular foliations sharing singularity, which come from interleaving polygons and then transverse everywhere else. All right, so that's one space. And now we go a little further. Because we want to remove the singularities. Um, All right. Yeah. So when you have the picture of any circular continuity, and imagine that the action of the circular continuity is the action of the property. Okay. You mean the idea of boundary of this yeah. is the same as the circle we started yeah, with? You to, yeah, when you have a of transformations to reason. Compactification by a circle. Yeah, I think so. I think I can I can identify. It. Yeah, there is a way to identify. It. That's true. I mean, I was worried worried about the cuts, but they are already on the point in the circle anyway, right? Because they are pivot. I mean, identify with the pivot. Okay, okay. Yeah, you can identify them. Um, <clears throat> I forgot the notation for after removing a single point. Uh -huh. Actually, the zero one is that. Yeah. So that one is far. Oh, I see. Uh, I, mean, I mean, no. No. First one. But, oh, I see. W is zero. Is you, mean, you, mean, you, and w is you mean this? And then <laughs> that, that, that one is, that one is w. Then the, the zero is w, and the last one is w is proper zero. That's you're 
as you see, the author can re author cannot remember the notation. So not, uh, that, okay, so I guess it's not important what it called, but I mean, the, you, you know, the step by step construction is important. So let's just stick to what I wrote here. So um, the, now the final thing that we is uh, you further remove uh, the singular point. Okay, so what's the benefit of that? And now you get um, something with transfer foliation without singularities. And this advantage is, of course, this is not a plane anymore. So you go to the universal cover. So that's the universal cover. So that's, that you can show is homeomorphic to plane with transfer foliations. And where is the... Uh, another intermediate theorem that this guy with this foliations we constructed from laminations is a loom space. And the loom space is the one uh, which is defined in Frankel, Schleimer, and Segerman. Let me quickly say what it is. A bifoliated plane, a plane with a transfer foliation, it's called the loom space. If the following is satisfied, so um, the first of all, if you have a bifoliated plane, we call is that meaning I should stop? No, not, not yet, right? We still got seven minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, um, so I guess this is the disadvantage of this talk. So some this is not a pair of point. The interval from zero to one. So this is open square going to map R2 so that, well, this is naturally foliated by horizontal segment to vertical segment. And if F maps horizontal segment to the part of leaves of F plus and the vertical segment to part of leaves of F minus, then we call this embedding a rectangle in the bifoliated plane. And you can. Think about the limit of horizontal segments, image of the horizontal segments in R2. So if I do this, that's why this is T cross zero one. If T goes to zero, that's this size. So if the limit exists, when well, the li limit is called the left side of the rectangle. And if I do this, T goes to one, that's the, the limit is called the right side of the rectangle, et cetera. So this embedding of an open square, foliated open square into your bifoliated plane is a rectangle. And the sides of rectangle are defined as a limit of like this. But sometimes two sides have a uh, intersection. Sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do. And when they have intersection point, then that is called a corner. So the corners may or may not exist for the rectangles. So if your rectangle, when you take this limit on, on both all four sides and the corner exists except one, then this is called a corner rectangle. Okay, I have everything on this board is not my terminology. It's just Schleimer and Segerman, so don't blame me. The corner rectangle. <laughs> and if you have uh, four points missing, but each point on each side, when you try to take this limit, but four, four corners exist. In this case, this guy is called a tetrahedron rectangle. Tetrahedron rectangle. So here is the definition of a loom space using that. First, every rectangle is contained in a or a rectangle, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I see. Sure. Uh, it's called cusp rectangle. You see. And every cusp rectangle is contained in some rectangle. Actually, the side, uh, this is called cusp. The side with the cusp, um, it's called the cusp side. Actually, that side should be contained in some rectangle. So if you have this type of cusp rectangle, then what the axiom, one is saying is there's some other rectangle looks like this. 
so that the cost side is contained in the rectangle. Rectangle is an open square, right? so you don't care about this part. Sorry about that. Um, and the second second axiom is every rectangle. Yeah, it's a continued tetrahedral rectangle. So every rectangle, what no matter what type is, is contained in a tetrahedral rectangle. And the third axiom is every tetrahedral rectangle that is by that the missing point on the horizontal side have different horizontal coordinates. So they are not on the same vertical segment. And the missing point on the vertical segment are not on the same horizontal segment. So this is the picture for each tetrahedral rectangle you, you should see. So that's the three axioms. If these are satisfied as this bifolate plane is called the lumen space. And why do they construct like this? Um, because this one, you can actually use it to construct actual um, triangulated dream out. So the tetrahedron rectangle is called tetrahedron rectangle because it will be, become a tetrahedron. So what do you do? Well, you have this picture and uh, you draw edges between any two pair of missing point. There are six of them, but there is a choice to make. Once you make a choice and one goes above the other, then you can think this as a projection of a one ideal tetrahedron. <laughs> and what happens is that by repeatedly applying the other axioms in the definition, for instance, you have this cost side should be contained in some other rectangle. And if you look at this rectangle, that should be contained in some tetrahedron rectangle. So we already have three missing points. It should be somewhere at the missing other point. What happens is that you find the tetrahedral rectangle where the three missing point is shared with the one you already had. So when you try to build a either triangle on the next level, it will be a tetrahedral which shares a face with the either tetrahedral you already constructed. So you can construct um, sort of inductively like this by replacing each tetrahedral rectangle by an ideal tetrahedron. So you actually get um, what they share, the Slimer and Sagerman paper, what they share is so what you get at the end of the day is R3 with varying triangulation. So from, from here, you have R3 with varying triangulation. And the, 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 the construction is functorial. So the, if you have a loom space and R3 constructed from loom space, then any Loom space isomorphism, meaning the homeomorphism of R2 preserving the foliation and all the rectangles. He induces an homeomorphism of R3 preserving the during triangulation. So, so that group of this covering, let's call it D, the deck group of this covering, act here as a deck transformation group, functorial property by the punctorial property of Schleimer and Shackerman, you get something as a quotient of R3 by modding out by the same group. That's not the manifold you were aiming to get because, well, we didn't use G at all. This is three manifold purely obtained in terms of the lamination pair. So now you remember you start to have a group acting on the circle with invariant laminations that laminations being invariant will give you action of G until here. It doesn't really give you an action of G here. You can lift each element, but that doesn't lift as a group. But you get an action of G here via this functor. But you can go further to mod out by G which now is a three manifold depending on G, which is still not the three manifold you're looking for because you don't know this is simply connected. So what happens is that this guy is actually has a lot of cylindrical boundary component and analyzing the group action 
I didn't really talk about group action part today much. So analyzing the group action, you can uh, show that you can extend, uh, you can fill in all the cylindrical component, boundary component by adding solid cylinders and, add, uh, and extend the group action there and make it simply connected. And then quotient being the three manifold, which has G as a fundamental group. So that's the step you have to go. So the last step is another like same length story I didn't really talk about because you need to really understand the group action. But um, let me stop here. Thank you. So what we read the group that the quotients are manifold, right? You know, when you take quotients on the right hand side, both quotients are automatic. By D and then by G, you get the yeah. Right. Right. But here, um, the 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 induced, I mean, lift of the group element act here as a top isomorphism on R three. So you get something already. The quotient of the triangulation is also there. Okay. So if you actually go through all the construction at the end of the day, well, assuming this is compact, then you can even get a hyperbolicity by applying the geometric changes, which I didn't have to just say. So can you characterize the uh fold that you get? The great question. Um so Remember the top polyation implies this pi one action and also the veering triangulation, right? Um, so from our construction, what we get is we get a three manifold with veering triangulation. And once you have a three manifold veering triangulation, you can consider the top polyation carried by the the two skeleton, the horizontal branching surface. And can you can you show that gives you the original data back? I don't know. Um, but one thing is, uh, I think the recent paper or recent unpublished paper, the Minsky Taylor laundry mm -hmm. shows um, the veering circle can be considered as a universal circle for the top foliation carried by the horizontal branching surface of the veering triangulation. So in that particular case, uh, it's, it's true. So you have more canonical correspondence there. But in general, I don't know. So I don't know uh, how general the construction is yet. Um, so, so are you saying that um, the manifold you get here always has a foliation or from the veering? Right, yeah. And particular, does that mean that the manifold has constant boundary components or? So it depends on uh, what you started with. So if you assume that you, so we allowed both polygons and crowns as the gaps, so you, you can consider two extreme cases, like no crowns or no polygons. So if there's no crowns, then you would get something with no cusps. So that sort of the example is an actual like, you know, mapping towards a, a closed surface uh, situation. Um, when the other case with no polygons, that's if you really start from veering triangulation and construct a veering circle, then there's no polygons there. So right, right. that's the other extreme case. So it's this sort of you know interpolated these two cases. Um, but 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 Steve's question, I mean, how general it is, I I, I don't know. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank Harry again.